welcome back to Bible study. Welcome back to Psalm 50, a Psalm of Asaph. Uh, we reached verse eight, didn't we? Welcome, Derek. That's right. Welcome, Hi. welcome, John. Thank you. We reached verse eight, but I think we're going to read the whole Psalm again. John, we are. Because I thought, well, we've got John reading, so oh. why don't we just and wear him out? <laughs> <laughs> Right, do you want me to start? Are we when getting being serious now? Oh, I am. Okay. I am. Right, Psalm 50. Here we go. A Psalm of Asaph. The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is a judge. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth? seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your, deceit, your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be, one, and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. Amen. 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 Lord, thank you for your word that you remind us, you warn us that there is a judgment day coming. Lord, that we will give account to you. And Lord, we pray that this psalm, through meditating on it, Lord, will inspire us in our life, that Holy Spirit, you'll speak each one, to each one of us, Lord, where we need to, Lord, draw closer to you and live righteously before you. Lord, thank you for your word speaking to us through this psalm. Holy Spirit, we ask for your help to, to make it come alive to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> wow. Yes, when I sort of read through with you it, you, it strikes me we're living in a society that's so biblically illiterate. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it takes a bit for us to grasp, I think, some of what this is. And I find it a relief when we get to the final verse, which we will eventually get to. But... Um, don't you feel a burden for those who are outside the faith uh, and who have been, who, who have had the, the Christian faith and the scriptures completely shuttered off from them? Mm. That we have a whole, more yes. than one generation now. It's a challenge, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's a huge challenge. That's right. It's more than one generation. It's yeah. certainly the children and their parents, definitely those two generations are totally biblically illiterate. They might have done some form of comparative religion at school, but that, that doesn't help. No, they know The nothing. idea of judgment. The idea of judgment. That, the idea of God 
Exactly. I, I, it is, has been so, it's still in there, of course, as we keep saying week after week, and it's so important that God mm. has set eternity in, in our yeah. hearts. Yeah. So the knowledge of God is there. And, and, and Paul picks up that very powerfully in, in Romans 1. Um, the knowledge of God is there, but it has been willful, instead of being nurtured by the older generation, which is what it should have been at school, at Sunday school, at church, by parents, by grandparents, it has been exactly the opposite has happened. Yeah. So there's no back cloth. Nothing, nothing. And, and, and old fashioned evangelism, you wonder whether, you know, you just sound like a madman on a soapbox. That's right. Yeah. There's nothing to work with. Yeah. Well, so, of course, the Lord excels in that sort of situation, doesn't true. he? So, well, he did with Abraham. <laughs> yes. I mean, so we, yeah. but, it, but it forces us to, yeah. to just to fall back on him. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's huge. And, no, it's and really here in this army, it's so exciting because, yeah. you know, the, the, we see the, how the Lord sends out the order, summon the world, bring them all to me and my That's people, it. my That's saints, yeah. you know, those who are in covenant relationship with me. And he summons them all and says, I'm going to speak. Yeah. And then he speaks to his people. The reason I was prompted to ask that question is that verse 21, you thought I was altogether like you. Now, yeah. you know, we're not, God's ways are above our ways. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not like him, but how much more difficult when there's no background, you know, understanding or perspective. If we're so much not like, I mean, we're made in his image, but we're not altogether like him, it, the devil knows that he can, he can take a whole generation and, mm. and well, hood, he's, hoodwink them. He's had the tools to work with, <coughs> David and in David's time rather, they yeah. didn't have, you know, the, 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 these things, you know. That's true. These yeah. things. No idea what that and, is. And, and <laughs> no idea what that is, no. You said that the, the world is connected from the moment it wakes up to the moment it goes to sleep is connected to the internet, mm -hmm. and it's being fed. And we know who the who the who the prince of the prince power of the, the, air is. the air is. We know who that is, yeah. and boy, has he exploited it. They believe anything and everything except the truth. Yeah, but they'll do their best to try and convince you that you don't know what you're talking about, yeah. that the Bible is just a concoction of man yeah. being corrupted by the Jesuits. Well, that yeah. may or may not be true, but, but um, you know, and, and, and they haven't read it. That's the no, point. No, they haven't. They, they, but they have no experience of the interlocking and yeah. the depth of scripture. And a man couldn't write this. That's right. Exactly. It, I mean, a computer couldn't write it. Even yeah. a quantum computer yeah. I <laughs> just couldn't write That's this. It, it is exactly. far too amazing yeah, spirit, and it is alive it's alive it's alive exactly it's alive. Mm. the spiritual dna in the scriptures <laughs> yeah. on that note derek should we get back to i think we reached verse eight last week yeah so to set the scene it's it, it it's very much like uh I, I call it a prophetic psalm because it it feels like an old testament prophet yeah and in fact asaph was a prophet he was god a seer so it kind of starts with this grand uh, scene of judgment, yeah. of, of, a, of a public judgment, yeah. uh, where telling them basically the day is coming when mm -hmm. God's going to judge each one of us, including his people. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the emphasis in this psalm, God, God judging his people, Israel. But of course, we could apply this very same stuff to, to the church. Yeah. Um, now, if we're born again, we need to make it clear that we, we, there is no condemnation in Christ. This won't be a judgment for our eternal condemnation. But nevertheless, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we will give an account for our lives and our eternal reward and, you know, will we'll very much depend on that. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so it's very, we won't go over it again, obviously, but the first six verses are this, this presentation, a very grand presentation, reminiscent of Mount Sinai. When God came down on Mount Sinai, it's similar to that and on purpose, because in a way God is now going to judge them by the Ten Commandments. And then the actual sermon where God confronts two areas of sin among his people, the sermon's in two parts, starting in verse seven. The first part, which we made a little start on last time, yeah. from verse seven to 15, God is judging their worship. Um, and the issue there, the sin, if you like, is we could call formalism and ritualism. They're, they're going through the motions. They're doing all the right stuff physically, but it, there's, their heart isn't engaged. 
and, and that's an issue uh, for God. And, um, and, and then the second part, so the first one is about their worship, and the second part's about their lifestyle. Um, yeah. One's vertical, if you like, mm. you know, which I call holiness, and yeah. the other one's horizontal righteousness. Mm. And it, he, he actually is bringing the Ten Commandments to bear, yeah. that, which were written on two tablets. The first tablet was to do the worship to God. The first God, four right. commandments govern their, their worship toward God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mm. basically. Mm. And that's, the, that's what he's challenging them on yeah. in the first section. They weren't loving yeah. God with all their heart. They were, they were going through the motions. And then the second tablet, the last six, were towards, you know, Behavior towards love your neighbor as, as yourself. yourself. Yeah. And, and they were failing in that area. And he picks out a few of them mm. in the second part of the message from verse 16 onwards of, of where they were breaking those, other, those yeah. commandments too. Certain, not all of them, but a certain section of them. Yeah. So that's the kind of outline of it. That's excellent. I, <coughs> that great commandment, as the Lord um, calls it, there I mentioned Martin Lloyd-Jones. I was, I was listening to him in, in, this, in this interview with Joan Bakewell, and he said the problem today is they put that the, the other way around. Yeah. And oh, it, yeah. that, is, that is a great failing, isn't it? If we don't get our worship of God <coughs> sorted out, right, and our, our relationship with God sorted out, mm. you know, it's going to be pretty chaotic if we're trying to resolve horizontal relationships or lifestyles or whatever, whatever you say. And that's um, what Romans 1 says, yeah. that really the, the rot starts when you s suppress the knowledge of God in your heart yes. and you exchange God for an idol, for, yeah, for yeah. the things he's made. Yeah. Once that, it begins with that idolatry, the vertical, and then that leads to a moral decline, um, yeah. and not individually and also in society. And, and, you know, we do have the social gospel, but that's all part of the, you know, social action, you know, political action, all, all trying to sort things out, loving your neighbour as yourself, as it were, which is, which is a worthy thing to do, but without the faith, mm. without the repentance, without the right relationship with God. That's right. And, and unfortunately, um, modern churches not all, I mean, but, but there's a tendency to teach and encourage the social gospel yeah. without teaching, and in, the, teaching the, the gospel, the gospel. Of, which is the cross. The social gospel, you know, c continues naturally from the gospel of the cross. It, 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 it should be a part of the fruit of, 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 the, of the church to, to deal with those problems. And, but it, you apart from it. it. They do it apart from it because it's all a bit messy and bloody and not very nice and a bit old-fashioned and medieval and we really don't want to get into That's that. True. Yeah, it's an ancient scripture, no, so what's that got to do with the modern world? Blood, sort of bloodthirsty thing. Old Testament God, you know, we, we, yeah. we, we're enlightened now, we don't need yeah. any of that. That's right. Let's have a seeker-friendly service. Yes. Okay, the classic verse on that is yeah. 2 Timothy 3.5, it says, having a form of godliness <gasps> yes. but yeah. denying its power. Yeah. From yeah. such people turn away. In other words, those who are teaching that, you know. Uh, in other words, and this this was the problem in the first part of the sermon. Uh, you have people yeah. who have a form of godliness, yeah. um, but they deny the power, which is God, which is Christ yeah. Himself. Yeah. In other words, the whole power of a godly life is is your relationship with God through Christ, and and without that, it's a lot of platitudes. But there's yeah. no real power in loving your neighbor. If you're not loving God, yeah. if you're not connected to God, you don't really have any power to really love your neighbor. I've often thought that's secular <clears throat> humanism. It is the form of godliness, you know, and even yes. a high form, you know, a pharisaic form of godliness mm. in the modern secular world where, where they are judging what is morally right yeah. and, and wrong, but in a very pharisaical way. But it's only a form mm. of godliness, sadly. Yeah. yeah. And they deny the resurrection, yeah. Yeah. which is denying the real the well, heart, is, it, the, it the power of the resurrection. Exactly. Yeah. And um, exactly, so what happens down the generations, and John was talking about this, uh, there's, if there's a generation that, that stops having a living faith and the parents just communicate morality to their children, yeah. you know, the Christian morality, yeah. they say, well, all that really matters is that they're good people yeah. and nice and so on. But, you know, whether they have a, a faith in the risen Christ, it, okay, that's not so important. Yeah. But the point is, without 
faith, morality has no strength, yeah. not against the power of sin yeah. uh, and so on. And, and so that next generation may well have a form of morality, yeah. but they don't, then what they pass on to their children has no power because the children say, well, why should I behave like that? Yeah. You know, because there's no basis for that morality. There's no power behind that morality. And then they create another basis and then they create yeah. another It morality. takes a few generations to feed all the way through. Yeah, yeah that's right. But that, sadly, that's what's been going on. Yeah. I, one other connection I want to point out. You know, out. That, that's just reminds me, I know I'm a bit slow on the uptake, it reminds me of, I think it was another David Pawson quote, where uh, he was speaking to some workers in a cafe, and, and, they, and they said, well, no, I, 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 live, I live a good life, uh, you know, and I don't, I, don't need, I don't believe in God, you know. And then he says, Yes, but I, I'm, I'm sure your grandparents did. Mm. And I'm, I'm sure your grandchildren won't be leading a good life. In other words, there'll be a mm. decay. It was quite an... I, I've yes. mucked up. Yeah. Sorry, David Pawson. Yeah, <laughs> it's no, gone no. to glory a long time ago, but that's the it danger. Makes the point. Makes yeah, the it's point. a good point. Makes yeah. the point. Yeah. 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 Okay, sorry, you were going to... Well, I was just going to say, another connection is, understand that it starts with this vision of judgment. Yeah. But, but in the sermon... God is, God is actually shining his light, but it's privately. It's betwe between God and each individual. You know, that's the beauty of a, of a sermon rather than, you know, a public judgment. Yeah. And so 1 Corinthians 11.31 says, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And that's an important principle that God actually confronts us, you know, through his word, confronts our sin and so forth, as he's doing in this psalm. He's very much confronting Israel and, and her sin. And, and, and so that they would judge themselves, yeah. you know, and put it right, confess it, repent, put it right. Uh, and then that thing will not be brought up yeah. against them in yeah. the judgment. But I believe that if we don't respond to God's private dealings with us, mm. then it will be brought into the open. Yeah. In, there will be a day when all things are revealed. So yeah. it's better to, to bring it, Very to deal good. with it now. Exactly. And just, you know, I'm not talking about losing salvation or anything like that. Yeah. I'm just saying um, we need to deal with the issues in our life now mm -hmm. as God can, you know, deals with us. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what he's doing here. He's, he's bringing, you know, these two main issues yeah. to, 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 to his people. And, and saying, you know, because there is a day when everything's going to be brought to the light. If you yeah, don't exactly. deal with it now, it will be dealt with, exactly. you know. Exactly. Great. Um, yeah, because I've sort of roved over a number of subjects, I lose my place in which verse we've reached. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, reached next. we could... Yeah. All Cause we I, I would recommend that, um, say, verse... 7 to 11 yeah. is all of a oneness. Yeah, yeah. We could probably deal with it as a block. Okay, let's do Because that. in a way, it's... Let's do it, that. In an interesting way, he's, he's addressing their formalism. Mm -hmm. But um, he notice, he, verse 7, he, Hear, O people, and I'll speak, O Israel, and I will testify That's against right. you. I am God, your God. So yeah. he's, he's asserting his authority, and, and he is confronting them. Yeah. He loves them. Mm. He says, I'm your God, you know. That's right. We're in, you know, That's right. this is God dealing with his people. He we loves us. that, didn't we, last week? But, but you know, I agree. he is confronting that. Yeah. And then, I don't know, if it, when he is he's now talking about the fact that, uh, is it, should I read it is or should saying, I just I don't summarize need, it? To summarize it. Is he saying, I don't need your good works? Uh, but you're going to summarize it much better. No, he's not. Better he's not, saying, not exactly. I, I will not rebuke <laughs> your you for your sacrifices he's he's told them to do that they're yeah. being obedient yeah yeah their, their heart's wrong but they're doing what he's told them to yeah. do so he's not going to rebuke them for that no but he's going to rebuke them for what's going on within them and their attitude towards it yeah very good uh, there i think what he's emphasizing because it he he is getting at something that in a way is there but mm -hmm. you you kind of have to dig a little okay. bit but he's 
there's this pagan idea, you know, like in, in temples that, you know, they bring their food. I think particularly of Hindu what know, temples. Yeah. You bring the food and, and the god, as it were, needs that food to, yeah. to feed on. Yeah. And, and he's definitely coming against the idea that God it's, I can't imagine, you know, uh, th uh, that being a kind of holy worship when you when you when you see it all molding there, because it will all go mm. manky, won't it? Yeah. But it was also in the uh, ancient yeah. Middle East. It's not just in the Hindu. I, I mean, in this pa yeah. passage, he makes it clear this, how absurd it is. Yeah. Yes. You know, I created this universe. And, yeah. But well, he's pointing out that in a way, their mindset was, we're, we're doing this for God's sake. We yeah. are offering all these animals up. Yeah. You know, and in a way, they, they were doing it as a kind of physical religion, uh, earning points with God, of yeah. works righteousness. God, you know, we're doing God a favor because we're giving him all these, these expensive animals, these sacrifices, and yeah. somehow we're, we're satisfying a need in God mm. for, for all these sacrifices and stuff. And, and God is saying, you know, I, don't, already I don't need that. Already these mine. things are not... And the, you know, I was struggling with this, and then I suddenly realized, you know, what are these physical things we do? We may not offer up animal sacrifices, no. but we might give money in, the, in an offering. That's right. we, we might use our mouths and sing songs of praise. We, we might serve God in tangible ways, and these are very important. God, but they are for our sake. They are meant to be expressions of love to God. Those sacrifices, they're meant to be offered out of a heart of love for God as a sweet-smelling offering. That's the the offering of the heart. Um, when we sing songs, that gives us a physical way to express our love for God. When we give in offerings, when we serve God with our gifts, these are physical ways in which we can love God. It's yeah. not that God needs that, uh, you know, our yeah. physical actions, yeah. Yeah. but God really wants our heart. He, yeah. he wants our love. Yeah. And, and these are just ways in which we can express it. So the problem becomes that we think that God's just interested in the physical actions or sacrifices or whatever and that they are and whether our hearts in it or not it's irrelevant if I've That's I it. can tick that box yeah you know I've, I've, I've read my chapter of the Bible today I've, I I've gone to church yeah. you yeah. know I can tick that box and the fact that I was not thinking about God in the service at all but I was thinking yeah. about what I was going to have for lunch is not important because I've given God what yeah. what he wants you know and and I'm he owes me now because I've, I've done him a favor you know, a and misunderstanding of God. It's a misunderstanding, and God, yeah. that's what God is correcting, essentially. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that God wants our heart. And yeah. in a sense, the one thing, because he says, you can't give me animals. I, 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 could, I made them. I could take any animal yeah. I want. I could create one if I needed that. Yeah. But the one thing that God doesn't have, in a sense, that only we can give him, is our heart. Mm. He, 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 as John said, he's not against those sacrifices because he ordained them. He wants us and to see. And they can be an expression of the heart. Exactly. They so can. they are good as long as they're an expression yeah. of the heart. Um, Reminds me a bit of Christina Rossetti. What can I give him if I were a shepherd? Exactly. I would bring if I were a wise man, I'd do my part. Yet what I can, I give him. Give my heart. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So you got something there. Yes. That's exactly right. But, it, but e even, even that can be tricky, can't it? Because it, it's, it, it alludes to it here in verse 14 where he says, it talks about offer to God thanksgiving. And, <coughs> and praise is really, it's not, it's not devoid of thanksgiving. In the, the, he, the Hebrew words used join sacrifice and thanksgiving together. Mm. And if you come with a grateful heart, then the praise just naturally flows from it. If there's no gratitude, you can't force praise. You, it's just words, it's actions, it's lifting mm. your hands, it's singing songs, yeah. it's empty. Mm. It, which we've it, all experienced, by the way. Which we've all, I, I mean, which you, which it, we've I, all I, I, experienced. So, but here, we're, we're given the clue. Offer, in verse 14, offer to God thanksgiving. Yeah. And that causes you to stop and pause and think, well, what have I got to thank God for? To which the answer is absolutely everything. Mm. Everything. So where do you want to start? Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, very good. Just you woke up this morning, you got out of bed, you had breakfast, yeah. you know, you ran the tap and were able to clean your teeth. You know, different for a d different areas Again, in the world. Not all his benefits. No, this exactly, absolutely everything, and the Lord will receive your thanksgiving as praise and worship. Mm. Mm. They aren't separate. They aren't different. And, and as you go through thanksgiving and, and begin to realize how grateful you are for just for the gift of breath, just for the gift of life, just for the gift of everything you have, because there was nothing that was made that was not made. Everything, every single thing is rooted in Christ. Yeah. You know, uh, this book, I, I, it happens no, to be the Bible, the but words. if it was any old book, you know, it's printed on paper. <laughs> the ink, the paper, the, the wood that the, pa uh, the, the paper is all rooted in creation. Yeah. Man can't create wood. Can't cre he can only create paper because of wood, but man couldn't create wood if he hadn't been given wood in the first place. So it all comes down to creation. Quite profound, isn't and it, that the wood of the cross was created yes. by Christ, the nails, uh, everything, the iron. Everything, nothing, nothing, nothing in creation exists. We might have taken it and applied it, but, but we can only do it because the ore is there, the elements are there, the timber's there, the whatever it is. We can only do it. So everything is rooted in Christ. So when you begin to meditate at night, you yeah. can start to thank him. And as you thank him for everything, that moves into genuine praise. Mm -hmm. Well Genuine or wonderful. Yeah. No, really well put, really, really well put, because we, we take everything for granted. We do the opposite of exactly what you just beautifully, opposite. eloquently described. We, yeah. we take it all for granted, the yes. getting up in the morning, you know, the food, yeah. the drink, the air, the, the mm. sun, the moon, yeah, everything. Yeah, and, the, and that was definitely this issue that the psalmist is putting his finger on is definitely the issue for, for all believers. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it was where where in Jesus' time this was the main problem with the Pharisees, you know, and and he would quote Isaiah twenty nine thirteen in, in Matthew fifteen eight he says these people draw near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips but their heart is far from me, mm -hmm. and so it's talking about the distance between us and God and and seeking God. In other words, when we are singing or when we are praying or when we're we're doing Bible study or whatever. What's got to be in our heart is the desire to get closer to God, to, to seek closeness with God, to seek deeper union with God. And it, while we, our heart is moving towards God, because he's saying the problem is that their, their heart's removed and they're just going through the motions with their mouth. So the key is, if you find yourself doing that, is get close to God. And how do you get close to God? We enter his gates with thanksgiving. We enter Very his good. courts with praise. We draw close to God. And, and You're just reminding me of, of, of our dear brother, Alan, who used to sit in that seat, John, you know, yeah. not many years ago, pre-COVID. And I, I, uh, Sarah asked me to speak at his funeral. Um, he went to glory um, because of COVID. Uh, but or as you said, the invasive yes. you know, treatment after, yes. after that. But, he, um, but I picked that verse, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart always be acceptable. And mm. I, I said with Alan, the two were the same. Mm. Yeah. And, and you know, this, this idea that you know, he would honor God with his lips without his heart mm. uh, be, being the driving force of that wasn't Alan. Mm. Yeah. And, and he, every word counted because it had gone through the filter of his heart. He, you know, yes. he was weighing up the words and he'd often sit there, like you're sitting there, weighing things up and then, yes. and then speak. So, you know, it's with our, with our mouths, you know, with our words, we will be acquitted and with our words, we will be condemned. That's how serious it is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and as John pointed out, the. Actually, both parts of the sermon, one of it in, one ends, I think, in verse 14 and 15, and then the other one ends in verse 23. They both, they're quite similar, because um, the first part, having pointed his finger at what's wrong, yeah. he then says, this is what I want. Yeah. yeah. And, and he does the same thing at the end. And in both cases, both cases, the key word, as John pointed to, was thanksgiving, yeah. which is the, actually a special word, tauda. It's the Hebrew word tauda, which means sacrifice of thanksgiving or, or sacrifice of praise. Mm. 
It's, it, it's basically thanksgiving based on faith in God's promises. Yeah. You know, there is a thanksgiving based on the manifestation, or oh, God gives you something, you know, thank you. <laughs> but actually a lot of things we receive from God, we receive through his promises, don't yes. we? We, yeah. we? He promises to forgive us. You know, there, there is no physical manifestation yeah. that says we're forgiven, but, but we believe his promise. And, and when we thank God based on his promise, apart from any man physical manifestation, that is a sacrifice because it's the flesh responds to physical manifestations. It, the flesh would thank, hopefully at least. But when you're basing your thanksgiving on God's promise, yeah. you are actually praising his character. You're saying you are faithful to your promise mm. and I'm thanking you on that basis. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for for forgiving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. That's then thanksgiving. Yeah. And what he is saying in a way is he wants our whole Christian life, our whole worship to God to be based on thanksgiving, mm. or in other words, based on a grace relationship with God, you see, because they, what he was against there, they were having a works relationship with God, mm. right? They were pressing all the right buttons and, and doing this legalistic observance of all the right physical stuff. Yeah. And that was a works relationship where they were trying to earn points with God. And God says, I'm not interested in that. I want your heart. In fact, I've done everything for you. I'm just repeating what John said really, but yeah. I've done everything for you by grace. Yeah. And thanksgiving is your response to grace. We're so grateful to what God has done in salvation, we just want to thank Him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's, then everything else flows out of that. Our worship of God, our serving God, our giving to God, it all flows out of this spirit of thanksgiving. And, that, and that's what God is looking for. I find What's it, it ringing, don't. just to just, uh, interject, just it's with gone. Psalm 100, because it's ringing in my head. Um, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. That pretty well sums yeah, up all those it, points. It uh, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks, that's the relationship, the grace yeah. Relationship. That's lovely what you would say. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, John, yeah. I butted in. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's interesting, you know, the, the wisdom of God and, and, and the wisdom contained in the Hebrew language, which doesn't always carry across into translation. Mm. Um, and here's a case in point, this Thanksgiving, because it is a sacrifice. And it is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Now, isn't it interesting that God has introduced the word here, a sacrifice of thanksgiving, yeah. because in our fallen state, it doesn't come naturally to us. Yeah, good point. As, as you may, we take it all for granted. Yeah. And, and I, I suspect there's a sense in which that is okay. Mm. Um, it's a bit like the, 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 in the parable of, of the... Um, prodigal son, you know, the father turns around to the elder son and said, but everything I have is yours. So there is a sense in which it's okay to take it for granted, mm -hmm. but not to the point where you forget the source and why it's the case. And I, the fact that the Lord calls it a sacrifice of thanksgiving or a sacrifice of praise is because it doesn't come naturally to the flesh, is because we have to step into that place where we put the flesh down and allow the spirit ascendancy mm -hmm. so that we can enter into these things. And Countless people will testify, is it? You start off in the flesh and you gradually move into the spirit. Yeah. Um, that's just the way it is. When it's a sacrifice, yeah, it's from the heart. It is. Because faith, it comes from faith. It's faith. It's and faith, faith is of the heart. Absolutely. It's faith. That co it's, but understanding these things make it easier. Yeah, it's all right that you don't feel like doing it. That's right. But, but, but just take a check. Mm. You know, re to re you believe in your God. He wants you to do this. So just from your heart, start thanking him. Mm. It's a sacrifice. Sacrifice. You're putting the flesh under and giving the spirit yeah. ascendancy. Yeah. It is dysfunctional not to be thankful, yeah. not to be grateful. Yeah. You know, it does eat away, isn't it? If you're not a thankful person, yeah. it's not. It starts um, with a revelation of God's love. Yeah. Yes. You know, so faith is based on believing in God's love. Yeah. God's grace. And it's like the more we believe and know that we're forgiven, the more we will we will love. So yeah. what God wants is you could put it this way, instead of a man-centered religion where it's all about my performance, yeah. 
it's a God-centered relationship where it's all about God's love and grace. Mm. And, every, and, and our religion, if you want to call it that, is our response mm. to his love from a believing heart. We respond and, and, it, and it begins idea. with thanksgiving. Yeah, so it, and it's the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I, I, I may be wrong, but I think we're at verse um, 14 where he says, and fulfill your vows. Yes, yes. That's a tricky. <laughs> yeah, it is. Because well, we no, will... but, but if you're really thankful, you will fulfill. And yeah. if you're really in faith, and if, if you're in this grace relationship, I think it should become natural. Um, to fulfill we your forget, vows. don't we? We rationally <laughs> promise things to God <coughs> yeah. and then forget. Life moves on. So <coughs> we've all got unfulfilled vows. Yeah. The Lord knows that. I would it's like to re relate well that to you. Jonah. Okay. okay. Oh, that's good. Because um, this just matches mm. the scripture quite nicely. We, we've been through Jonah in the past, yeah, of course. In Recently. the fish. This is yeah. Jonah in the great fish. Jonah 2 9, he says, and, and basically he was there because he was disobedient to God. He didn't want to go to Assyria, you know, for good reasons in many ways. He wants to go to Britain. <laughs> so he disobeys God. He yes. wants to go to Cornwall. Well, yes. <laughs> um, and, and so now, you know, he, he, is, he is turning back to God. He's repenting. And, and he's basically saying, Jonah 2.9, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Yeah, very good. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So there's two things here. He's, he's, he's thanking God in advance. He probably doesn't feel like thanking God in the great fish, but he, he's got God's promise of deliverance. You know, God's salvation is, is, is his. And, and he says, I'm going to be so grateful to you for what you've done in saving me from yeah. all, all this stuff. Uh, and I'm going to give that, that sacrifice of thanksgiving. And then he says, I will pay what I vowed. And I believe yeah. that means that God, Jonah has vowed, Lord, you get me out of this, I'll go to Assyria, I'll go to Nineveh, I'll yeah. preach the gospel, no matter what the consequences might be. I'll, I'll pay that. And, and, so that's an, and then, because he made that sacrifice, and that, the Lord then spoke to the fish. Jonah yes. was now right before God. Yeah. Wow. And then God, that released God, if you it, like. It's amazing. To, 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 to do that. That, 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 that very concept is picked up here that, that, that yeah. Derek just illustrated in verses 14 and 15. Yeah. There's actually a parallelism, parallelism here which isn't at first immediately obvious, mm -hmm. but in the light of what we've just been saying, it, it becomes obvious. Right. Offer to God thanksgiving, and by the way, that's picked up in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 something. Yeah. Give thanks, thanks in, in, all in, in all things. Yeah, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Okay. So there's no question, you thank him for everything. Now mm. offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High while you're about it, you know, yeah. while you're about it, but offer to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Here's the parallelism. Once you do that, you're calling upon me in the day of trouble because here you are in some pretty grotty circumstances mm. and you're saying, Lord, thank you for this. Yeah. Thank you for this awful thing that's happening in my life because I know you are sovereign of my life. I know you are king of all my life. I know you will take what's bad and turn it for good. I trust you and I thank you that you are going to work all things to good because that you don't know what else is going on. You might have found yourself in a situation that you hate but when you look back in five years time, you're as if you hadn't been there, God was protecting you from something much worse, which was going on here. So you've got to trust him in everything. So give him thanks. And he receives that as a call. Okay, he says so. Call upon me in the day of trouble. Yeah. How are you calling? You're saying, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. This is awful. But thank you that you hear me. Thank you that you know. Thank you you haven't turned your back. And I will deliver you. Powerful, isn't it? It is actually a parallel. Yeah, so the two go But it together. doesn't, not immediately no, obvious. Not immediately. No, well done. That's very, very interesting. I just want to yeah. say one thing about praying, the, praying the vows, because I, I did, I struggled over that. But I, I would, especially through the Jonah example, I would see that as obedient. Because you might think, well, That's right. paying vows is that just yeah, more obedience. formal well, religion. it's fulfilling the vow. The, you know, anyone can give a vow, but it's yeah. actually fulfilling it, exactly. isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, paying and, it. And it's, you know, it's what Jesus said in John, 14, 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Um, in other words, obedience, yeah. true obedience, is actually an expression of love. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think he's saying, that the kind of rela religion or relationship God wants 
is, is one where we're, we're loving him from the heart. That starts with thanksgiving. It also expresses itself in a life of obedience, where, where we do what, you know, yeah. we, we know that God, God yeah. wants. Yeah. Not just a random vow, but we, we are actually obeying God from the heart. Mm -hmm. So he wants a heart religion. And then, as John said, call, calling on, or it might be, you know, calling on God in the day of trouble. Get, look, turn to God. When you're in a difficult situation, don't, don't turn to the flesh to medicate yourself or, you know, take alcohol or yeah. drugs or whatever else it might be. You know, call, call, turn to God. Scott, I mean, God is David, the David, all the way through the Psalms, uh, the, the Psalms that he's written, Gives, he demonstrates that again and yes. again and again. Yeah. He starts off, right, if you, there's a sense in which he's starting off in the flesh. He's bemoaning his situation, but he's talking to God about it. And then he gets through that because he has yeah. to, un he's a human, he has to unburden himself. He's unburdening himself to his heavenly father. Mm. And, and then as he unburdens and the Lord's listening, he's listening yeah. and he's lightening the load. And it gets to the tipping point where he can turn from that into praise. He knows that the God's got the case. He knows that yes. his father's got the case. He knows he's going to deliver. Him. It's got so much more substance than... New Year's resolution oh, yes. or giving things up for Lent. Yes. You know, they all seem very sort of superficial, well, like but this is rich and like substantial. A, a man-centered religion. Yes. Whereas this is God's... Uh, uh, very if good we point. read verse 15, call on me on the day of trouble and I will deliver you mm. and you will glorify me. Mm. In other words, it's all about the glory of God. And, and you could see three aspects of the glory of God. It's all about we'd, we are thanking him and we, we want to glorify God in our life. First of all, we glorify God by calling on, on him in the day of trouble, by turning to him. Yeah. We're saying, God, you're the answer. Yeah. So that glorifies God. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when God delivers us, yeah. when God manifests his mm -hmm. glory, God is glorified in the answer to our prayer. Mm -hmm. And then after he's delivered us, we glorify God by thanking him for it, mm. by testifying to others what God has done. Mm. So, but it's all about thanking God, glorifying God, you know, obeying God. It's all about, it's, it's God-centered. Yeah. It's us responding exactly. to God's grace. And that's what, that's what God wants, is yeah. this relationship rather than, this ri ra rather than ritual and religion. Yeah, exactly. But I do see the connection that you made the, the, the vows, the fulfilling of the vows and the calling yes. upon the Lord. Yes. Yes. There are it's different it, angles. Yeah. Different, different thing. But this thing about vows is interesting as well because there's sort of a warning here and pay your vows. Yeah. In other words, be very carefully what you, what you promise me you're yeah. going to do because yeah. I'm going to hold you to account for it, yeah. which is why we're told, let your yes be yes and your no be no and leave it at that. You know, don't swear on the Holy Bible, which mm, yeah. everybody thinks is right thing to do. No, my dad always said if you're in court, you affirm. You're firm. Absolutely, yeah, you're he firm. always said that to me. And I thought, well, I wonder what's that. Yeah, no, he's, he's right. Affirm. Don't swear. Don't swear on, on, the, on, the, on Bible. the Bible. No, he would affirm. You affirm. Yes. That you will tell the, the truth, truth, the whole, whole truth, truth, nothing but the truth. The truth. Yeah. And you leave it at that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, yeah, exactly. I, I interrupted you. You know, you do, I'm, just, yeah, no. I'm just saying, keep your vows few. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, I, was, I knew what I was thinking was the, the, the parable of the, the two sons, one who said, promised that he would do something and didn't. Oh, yes. And one who didn't mm. but, promise, did. but did it. Yeah. And that's almost like playing safe. So don't promise something that you're not going to deliver, that yeah. you're not going yeah. to fulfill. Yeah. But equally, determine in your heart you are going to fulfill. Yeah. Um, and prove it, as it were, in your actions rather than in your promises. Yeah, yeah. So and, and politicians. Obedience can reveals the true love. Yes. You know? So one person who says, "Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, I Jesus," know. but never actually does what they say. I know. Actually, your heart is revealed by. Yeah. Your your works. But there's an interesting yeah. thing on on verse 15. It if, uh, it appears in Robinson Crusoe. Oh, wow. Um, Go on. Yeah, and uh, Spurgeon talks about it. But uh, Daniel Defoe's book, who yes. prompt, no doubt was a believer, mm. after the shipwreck on the island, Crusoe was about to die, apparently, and um, I can't remember it. It's been a long time <laughs> since I read that. It, yeah. And and he was a real sinner, you know, and he he had the vices of a sailor, but his situation caused him to think, and he opens a Bible and he finds this verse, 
Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. And that night he prayed for the first time in his life, and thereafter there was in him a hope in God which marked the birth of the heavenly life. So Robinson Crusoe got saved on this verse. Isn't that a fan? That is... Although I hasten to add, this is fiction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Robinson Crusoe is based on fact yes, yeah. that we can affirm. Yeah. But no, that's quite moving, actually. I wish there were more books written with that. I do know some Christian friends who are writing novels that, that sort of bring the Christian element in, mm. but most of it's just got no spiritual substance. That's amazing, isn't it? It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Okay, so we've got, I think we've got to verse 15, which, mm. you, which you said was, was basically the first side of the book. Yes. Um, or, the, or the Ten Commandments. Yes. So um, let's keep going. We've got, we've got 10 minutes or so before. So yes, if, yes. Moving, if we move to the next part, now God actually addresses, well, verse 16, it's a change because he says, but to the wicked. That's right. So here he's actually focusing on a different group of people. Yeah. And, um, and it could, you could think of the wicked as the unsaved people in, in Israel. That's right. They were pretending to be religious, but in fact they were um, living I immoral lives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so it was worse than mere formalism. It was actually being, the, these were hypocrites. Because Can I try in, uh, you, you say, uh, and we say uh, the wicked, this could also apply uh, but to you, sort of secular humanist world, what right have you to declare my statutes? In other words, they're claiming this mor moral high ground, mm. but they actually aren't acknowledging God. We, we were no, they're not, about, but this is, this is slightly worse than this, because yeah, okay. this, Clean is, speaking, this, this, this is the congregation yeah. of Israel, if you like, okay, yeah. which is standing before him, and yeah. he's dealing first with those who are in covenant relationship with him, yeah. haven't got it quite right. Yeah. Now he's dealing with those who pretend to have a covenant relationship with him. Within Israel. Yeah, yeah and he's yeah. addressing that. Yeah. So it's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the, the nominally orthodox religious Jewish person. Yeah. If we were yeah. applying it to the church world today, we That's would right. be talking about people who would see themselves as good Christian churchgoers, yeah. but they're living immoral lives. They're living out of wedlock. They're, they're, they're living in sin. You know, they, they, they think that that's just fine. Um, or they're doing other things that are breaking God's commandment. Not just as, you know, we all, I had we all sin, but I've got they a are confession. living a lifestyle of sin. Yeah. No, I, I, I was I, in my 20s and I was invited to be part of a, a conference by a senior bishop who was based uh, as a prebend, they would say, down at Chichester, believe it or not. Was that with that? And you know what? It was the cathedral close was just filled with wicked men. And I went to a conference and the language was filthy, the, the, the innuendo was, was filthy, and, and, I, and I did attend the service. It was Bishop um, Eric Kemp, I think. Oh, name yes, was. I remember. He was an elderly bishop. But, but basically, they were going through all the practices of, of the rituals of the church. But I happened to, to go for a lunch afterwards. And, you know, the profanities and the filthy language by bishops or retired bishops of the church I just was utterly shocked. Mm. Utterly shocked. Mm. And I never went there again yes. as Mr. Whoever, Dr. Foster. You know, stepped in a puddle right up to his middle and he never went there again. <laughs> Mind you, Ch the Chichester Cathedral, they can get through a full cathedral uh, administering communion in about 10 minutes. It's extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> They've got it down to a fine art. I've never seen it. So you can just go we used to go regularly. That was our sort of parish church. I'm still, I'm still upset thinking about it, just recalling sure. it to my mind. I'm sure that, you, you are. Know, that so a young kid, naive kid, goes in thinking, oh, you know, that there's some, you can do something for the Lord, you know, in, in this, and, and then discovering, no, I'll go another way. Mm. I'll choose the road less travelled by. Mm. Yeah. That made all the difference, and here I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting that um, if you're in a religious society like Israel, or how we used to be, you yeah. know, when we were, as it were, a Christian society, that can breed religious hypocrisy. Yeah. Because, and, and like the Pharisees in Jesus' time, because 
you know, it's in your interests to be to go to church mm. and to to look like a respectable person because the society itself values that. Mm. And and if you don't go to church, that's a bit scandalous. So you're you're kind of forced to go to church if you want to have position that's in right. the society. That's right. But at the same time, in your heart, you're a long way away from God, and you you live an immoral life. And and in a way, to be a hypocrite is like to be a real trophy of Satan. I mean, that is like the ultimate. Yeah. To have someone who is pretending to be yeah. godly, but in, on the inside, the opposite. That it's like. Satan can't really improve on that because, right. you know, right. I mean, um, I if you have a straight forward sinner. It was the United Methodist Church, <coughs> I think. I, I don't want to uh, cast an aspersion on the wrong denomination, but walking in on, you know, as he was uh, uh, um, running for president, you know, with an enormous big Bible. And, you know, in the light of Lewinsky and all the rest of it, and uh, some of these other, Jennifer Flowers, I think her name was, and others, that he was, um, there was another world to the world that was, you know, I'm upright and church attending. Yes, it can be. But, I mean, we now live in a society where that, that, that pressure isn't quite so strong. Yeah. Um, because people don't, ha you know, in other words, you don't earn any, earn many points in society by going to church. Not so, anymore, no. no. no so, that's absolutely right. in a sense, our society's changed that way. Big time. You know, politicians don't really need to show that they're good churchgoers no. to, to get votes. So, but that's how it used to be, and that's how it was in Israel. That, you know, you would have people who would need to, for their respectability, show themselves, mm. you know, at, at the temple. Yeah. But a lot of them were hypocrites. And so, this next section, which no doubt we'll finish next time, Mm -hmm. This is what God is gunning for them because yes. he is really upset with them. Yeah. He, he is really strong with them for their own sake. Like Jesus was strong with the Pharisees because if they don't repent of this, if they think that their outward performance is somehow, you know, they're still okay, mm -hmm. um, you know, they'll end up in hell. Keith Green, you know, going to church every Sunday doesn't make you a Christian, just like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Didn't quite get the California accent, but yeah, no, it's true. But it's true. Well said. Yeah, okay, keep, keep going, um, because I think we, we won't finish. We've only got five minutes left, but I think we well, won't. A nice way to summarize these two sections, just to hold the, mm. the overall picture, is the first lot of people forgot that God was spiritual. You know, yeah. it, like John 4, 23, 24 is a good verse we should, should put in on the yeah. first section, which is, you know, God is spirit. And he is looking for worshippers who will worship him in spirit and truth. Yeah. God isn't physical that needs those animal sacrifices. Mm -hmm. They're for our sake, you know, or physical things are for our sake to help us express our love for God. But God is spiritual. So the first lot of people, they forgot that God is spiritual, that yeah. it needs to be a heart-to-heart -heart connection yeah. with God. But the second lot forgot that God is moral. That's very well. They forget that God is moral. And very of course, well. this is the issue right now in, in many well, of the well. denominational churches, isn't it? And yeah. even beyond that, somehow we can change our morality. That's right. God, God doesn't really mind if we live sexually immoral lives or, right. or whatever else. Mm -hmm. We violate God's word. Well, what they say is it's um, that the Bible, they, they change everything that we've done over all these years, painstakingly going through what is the scripture saying. They say, well, the Bible's progressive. <laughs> the gospel's progressive and they'll pick out little examples from the scriptures. So therefore, we can be progressive. Mm. That's the nature of the Christian message, yeah. that we can change, you know. So if we can change, then morality can change. And so this is how, how clever. That's another truth. God says, I, I, the Lord, do not change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, but it's very, so yeah. it's, it will be next time. But yeah. That's very current because very God is basically confronting that whole yeah. attitude yeah. And, and saying, if you're not careful, I, all your sin is going to be brought to the light and I will tear you to pieces in the judgment day and uh, all your, your um, re reasonings are going to yeah. fall to nothing. And, and never forget having an absolute humdinger of an argument at a, a dinner where I was seated next to Chris Bryant, MP, who's one of the, the 
big flag wavers in Parliament uh, for the LGBT rights and everything. We had an absolute hung dimmer. And, and on my right, on my left was Chris Bryant. On my right was um, the Bishop of Exeter, Michael Langrish. Um, who could only listen in <laughs> and come up to me afterwards and says, oh, I, I agree with everything you said. But, but Chris Bryant was really very much on the progressive view, you know, and, and the reinterpretation of, of every relationship in the scripture as that way rather yes. than this way. And it Always. just shows that, yeah, morality is important. And th th there are people who do have a spiritual, you know, perception and understanding. So what you've said, I've, I shall really weigh that one up. Mm. That, that there's, there's that spiritual that, that can be lost, but then there's separately, I think you're saying, yeah. the moral yeah. can be lost. The two can connect because yeah. the more you lose your spiritual connection with God, the more vulnerable you are yeah. to the immoral yeah. because that's the power of God is your, your connection to God. Mm -hmm. and, and so if your worship life goes down, you will, the presence of God in your heart will mm -hmm. diminish and you suddenly become, you lose your resistance to, to temptation. You lose your resistance to sin. Exactly. Your flesh becomes dominant. Said it. And then you become vulnerable in different areas. We're all vulnerable in different of areas. Of course we are. Of course um, we are. But there is a connection. Mm -hmm. So as Romans 1 says, once you stop really worshipping God from the heart, it's a downward yeah. spiral. Yeah. Wow. It's quite, quite deep, isn't it, Bible study? Thank you so much, John. And, and Derek, and yeah, a very salutary warning to us all. We're looking forward to ending Psalm 50 next week. Join us then. <laughs>